this talk's not called Fear and Trembling because of coronavirus. <laughs> it's called Fear and Trembling because of something Paul's going to tell us <laughs> in one of the passages we're going to use. And speaking of coronavirus, now is an even more important time to be proclaiming the gospel. We're in the end time harvest now. And this, you know, may be the end of the end times. And the end times might be now or it might be in 50 years or it might be in 100 years or it might be three weeks from now. But now's the time because the world, including the church, church meaning all the committed, you know, we're supposed to be committed followers of Jesus. The churches have pretty much gotten away from the Jesus on the cross being the center of salvation. And we've gone to everything from recycling to buying your coffee beans at the right place and making sure that you don't hurt anybody's feelings and making sure that you're nice and making sure that you have some nice songs on Sunday morning and then afterwards, you can go out to brunch, and you know you leave feeling pretty good about everything. Especially if you go to a place where the preacher tells you that God wants you to be rich, and tells you that when you pray for your Mercedes, tell him what color you want, what you want in the interior. So you know, say so that's my kind of church. Where do I sign up? <laughs> so this is the time because. The gospel's been hijacked, but preaching the gospel is not easy. I know this is, again, like preaching to the choir, but preaching the gospel is not always easy. And it's called fear and trembling because even Paul, my hero, as arrogant as he was and as intelligent as he was and how persistent as he was, there were times when he was scared. Because he was a human being. Like, you know, when he said to Timothy, of all the sinners, I'm the first. You know, I, I used to do all this stuff and, you know, the, now the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, that's what I keep on doing. You know, wretched man that I am. So, you know, you, you can feel his, his agony in that because he has the same nature from Adam and Eve that we have. You know, the good things we want to do, we don't do. The things we don't want to do, we keep on doing. <laughs> so, when, when it comes to preaching the gospel, though, at that time, they were going into a pagan world. They were Jewish evangelists, and of course, I'm not counting Israel, some of them were evangelizing Israel, but they went into the Roman world, the Greek world, they went into a pagan world to bring the gospel. And in the power of the Holy Spirit, not in their power, but in the power of the Holy Spirit, that message went out. And, you know, those of us that are here, our ancestors heard the message and became believers. I mean, all Europe was Christianized over, you know, a few hundred years or whatever, however you want to measure it. But, you know, our ancestors were card-carrying pagan Gentiles, Right? They didn't know anything about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They didn't know anything about the Torah. They didn't know anything about the prophets. They didn't know anything about the priests in Jerusalem and what was going on at the temple. But they came to faith in the Jewish Messiah, which is pretty neat. So they went into a pagan world, and now the gospel is also going out into a pagan world again. Is anybody here Irish? Okay, I saw an amazing thing about Ireland a couple of weeks ago um, on a YouTube. You know, Ireland has traditionally been so fervently Catholic. There were very few other places that were so faithful. Well, they're just about to demolish the biggest Catholic church in Dublin because nobody goes there anymore. So they're going to demolish the church. You know, the, the, the attendance at that church is like, you know, less than 10% of the people that are registered there. They're going to demolish the church. I mean, this is where we're going. You know, if you saw when they had, they, they had abortion legalized a couple of years ago, 
they were dancing in the streets and they were celebrating and they were carrying on. And their prime minister is an openly gay guy who's married to a man. And everybody just thinks that's wonderful. And they have this, you know, it kind of reminded me of when Moses came down the mountain and he found the big party going on at the Golden Calf. They were celebrating, you know, them going further and further into darkness. So now the gospel is going into darkness again. And it's all around us. It isn't just, you know, you don't have to go to New Guinea to meet people who don't know the gospel. You know, you can do it in Parma. You can do it in North Ridgeville. You can do it in North Royalton. You can do it in Fairview Park. You can do it in Avon. I mean, I forgot where you guys live. <laughs> but anyway, the, you, you need... <coughs> People who need to hear the gospel are all around us. All around us. So, things have changed, but they haven't really changed. So, we talked about before how the gospel seemed to be foolishness to those that are perishing. And we talked about the foolishness is a man who's executed in this brutal, horrible way, and somehow... That affects me living in 2020. And they thought it was foolish because they were living in, you know, 60 AD because it didn't make any sense. Because after all, from a human viewpoint, salvation should be follow the rules and be good. Right? That's what makes the most sense. Follow the rules and be good. You know, smack yourself around and do the right thing. And then you'll go to heaven. You know, don't kill anybody and don't steal any, you know. So it seemed to be foolishness. But Paul says to us, it's the power of God. This foolishness that seems to be from a human viewpoint is actually the power of God. So that's pretty cool. It's the power of God. And of course, you know, he says it's the power of God unto salvation because he's able to save us the way he wants to save us. He doesn't consult anybody. You know, the kingdom of God is a kingdom. It's not a republic. It's not a democracy. You know, God didn't say to Moses, you know, Moses, I'm thinking about this law, and I don't know, how do you think it's going to go over? I don't know. You might want to take a poll, but, you know, get a couple. I, I really want to get your opinion because I'm not sure whether. No, he says, here's the law. You know, salvation comes by Jesus dying on the cross. Beyond what's but totally beyond our comprehension. It makes no sense. It's not what we would expect. And it's power perfected in weakness. You know, God says, my power is perfected in weakness. You know, when it was just before Christmas, we talked about how Jesus was the little shoot, you know, and you could just break the shoot with your hand. And he didn't raise his voice. He didn't do, you know, he was quiet, humble. And as you'll see when um, Dave Onisco comes and does the presentation on the shroud, there was no, there's no evidence that Jesus resisted anything that was done to him. He didn't try to hit somebody back. He didn't say, hey, what are you guys trying to pull? I don't have to put up with this. If I wanted to, I could just vaporize you. And maybe I will. No, there was no resistance whatsoever because Isaiah says it'll be like a lamb going to slaughter, like a sheep before the shearer. A sheep can't do anything. The guy just cuts off the wool. And the sheep just stands there looking stupid. And it's beyond our comprehension. And it's so unusual that he, we did this before. For Jews request a sign, Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews a stumbling block, to the Greeks foolishness. The Greeks wanted an intellectual explanation, which just doesn't have. The Jews wanted to see a Messiah to come and restore the kingdom in an earthly way. Restore the kingdom of David and Solomon so that all their Gentile neighbors would be amazed by this new Israelite king 
who was now running everything. That's what they had in mind, even though the prophets don't really indicate that at all. Right? So it's foolishness all around. So where are we living now? The world thinks we're foolish. I mean, you watch the news media, right? You watch, I mean, I don't watch entertainment shows and I don't watch late night shows, but you have to be tolerant of everything except Christians. You don't have to be tolerant of Christians. You can tolerate any system of religion, any system of philosophy, any system of new age craziness, but we can't have this Jesus stuff. That's, that's out of bounds. That's out of the mainstream. Imagine? It's out of the mainstream. What a difference from when most of us were growing up. When that was the only mainstream. And you don't have to think real hard to remember that. But we look foolish to the world. You know, the pro-life marches, the world thinks are foolish. Public prayer meetings, the world thinks are foolish. The idea that you can only go to heaven by what Jesus did is nonsense. It can't be that way. This is all foolishness. They make fun of us at every turn. You know, they'll always talk about, oh, those right-wing Christians. You know, the Bible thumpers. The, you know, the holy water people. The, you know, you hear all these insults that they wouldn't dare do to Islam or to Hinduism or to Buddhism. But it's open season on Christians, no matter what denomination you're in. And, you know, the time we live in, as I always say, this idea of this, all this bickering that goes on between denominations and between different streams of thought, that's got to end. we got to present the gospel in a in a coherent, united way, because the world is withering away. And we don't know how much time is left. Coronavirus is probably not going to be the last event, but you have to take it into context. You know, a couple of months ago, there were seven or eight earthquakes that were over magnitude six and a half or seven. You know, the South has been flooded. There were tornadoes all through February. There's never tornadoes in February. You know, something's happening. So we need to go and do what Paul did, because what Paul did was, as you see in that passage, he preached plainly about a crucified Redeemer. He didn't, he didn't talk about some philosophical system of thought. He didn't talk about some, you know, kooky way to know your gods in a different way. He didn't preach about some new way to follow the law. He preached about, he says, I only talk about Christ and Christ crucified. That's all he wanted to talk about. And how the law was fulfilled. How the law was fulfilled, completed, and now we were in the new covenant of grace. And all you have to do is read Romans and Galatians to see the beautiful way he develops all that. And you can do that for your homework. But he does it in a plain language. He doesn't do it with debating skills, with wisdom of words. You know, he puts all that learning that he had that we talked about pretty much aside. And he basically tells everybody, Jesus is the son of God. You have to repent and you have to turn to him because it's the only way you can be saved. And for the most part, where he went, you know, some places he was met with rejection. Some places he was met with acceptance. and Some places they tried to kill him. And sometimes he had big audiences. You know, like the time, I forgot where it was, in Acts where he was preaching and there was a guy sitting way up in the upper deck and the guy fell asleep and he fell out, fell out of his seat and he hit the ground and he died. And then Paul said, um, hold on a second. He went over there, saw the guy was dead, prayed over him, the guy was raised from the dead. Then he got back up on the platform and said, now where was I? Oh yeah. And he went on. And uh, I think I might have been Lystra. They beat him, they thought he was dead. They took him to the outside of the city walls, threw him out, and then he wasn't dead, obviously. So he came back to consciousness and 
kind of shook his head a little bit and pulled himself together and he said to the guy he was with, well, let's go back in the city and pick up where we left off. You know, now we're worried that our neighbor's going to think we're crazy or our co-workers are going to think we're crazy or we might hurt somebody's feelings. That's a long way from what Paul did. You know, it kind of reminds me of those cartoons. Everybody's older here, so I can say this. You've probably seen these things on Facebook where it's, it's had like 19 year olds in 1944 and they're storming Omaha Beach. And then it's just 19 year olds and, you know, 2019, you know, they're looking for a safe space because they're offended yeah. by something somebody said. <laughs> That's pretty crazy. So Paul preaches this because he doesn't have to use debating skills. Because the truth doesn't need help. You know, the word of God is like a lion. If you let the lion out of the cage, it doesn't need your help to find something to eat. <laughs> right? You don't have to go, you don't have to go to the store and buy him a piece of meat. He's going to find his own meat if somebody doesn't shoot him first. But the truth doesn't need our help, and the Spirit doesn't need our help to fall on somebody, right? I mean, I just think, you know, when you read through Acts, it's just so cool. You know, somebody once said the book should be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit rather than Acts of the Apostles, which, you know, the humans get the billing. But I I love some of those things where, you know, Paul's in the synagogue, because, you know, Jesus said it's to the Jew first and then the Gentile, so he's following the the rule. And, you know, he's preaching in the synagogue, and the people are yelling at him and debating him and they're belittling him. You know, and outside the synagogue, he sees, like, you know, there's crowds of Gentiles waiting for him to come out. And he goes outside, and the Gentiles say, we want to hear what you have to say. They didn't know anything about a Messiah coming. But they wanted to hear what he had to say. The Spirit doesn't need our help because the human oratory is not what has the power. Now, sure, you know, you can go to a church where the preacher is a really good speaker and a really good preacher. or You can have somebody who just kind of talks in a quiet voice and, you know, the Holy Spirit uses them both in different ways. But it's not about us. You know, in, when I was in my office, I used to say to some of these young drug reps, the young drug reps, you know, I, I would say, no, you know, no, when, no. When, I would say, when you leave here, you may think I'm a crazy old man, but I don't care. Because I don't care what you think about me. My feelings don't get hurt if somebody says, oh, that's crazy what you say. Okay. But at least I told you. So it's not, it's not about us. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I was determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Because when you focus on the cross, when you focus on the person of Jesus, that's all you have to do. You don't have to sit around and read theological books for 17 years. And then say, oh, now I'm ready. Right? When Jesus gives the Great Commission, he says, go out in the world and make disciples. He doesn't say, go out in the desert for 14 years, study, read the scriptures, pray, fast, then come back and we'll discuss this. He says, no, as soon as the Spirit comes, you can go out and do it, as we'll hear at Pentecost. Because all he preaches about is the cross. So if the church talks about being nice to everybody, the gospel's been hijacked. If the church talk makes the environment the center of the teaching, the gospel's been hijacked. If the church talks about, well, you know, who are we to say? There's people who, you know, reject Jesus, but they're nice. And, you know, that we, we, I heard a guy on a YouTube teaching say, we have a reasonable hope. We would have a reasonable hope that everybody would be saved even if they've rejected Jesus, as long as they've done things to help people. You have to do things to help people, but that's not the gospel. The gospel is that he died for you. And if you reject that, 
you're rejecting the only thing that can cover your sin, which is his blood. The only way that your sin can be forgiven. So he only preaches the cross. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. I didn't preach to you in wisdom. I was actually scared when I started preaching to you. I had fear. I had trembling. And I didn't think I could persuade anybody. But then there was a demonstration. There were demonstrations of power by the Spirit. When all, And it's not just Paul. I mean, you can read about all the things Peter did, all the things about the others did. I always pick Paul because he's my favorite. But there were always signs and wonders that accompanied the preaching. You know, people would, Peter would walk down the road and his shadow would fall over some crippled guy and the guy would be healed. They would take handkerchiefs that they had touched to Paul and they'd go touch a sick guy and the guy would be healed. You know, Paul preaching raises the guy from the dead. Even Joel Osteen can't do that. Even Billy Graham could never do that, right? I mean, I'm not saying it couldn't happen, but that's pretty rare. Um, so it's not in the wisdom of men, but it's in, in, in this demonstration of power. Because Jesus is the sum and the substance of everything, and Paul's mission was to bring people to the cross. Which is our mission. Every, every every believer has to be an evangelist. You know, the woman at the well goes to the town after she's, you know, they wouldn't have used the word converted, but after she has this experience talking to Jesus, and she tells everybody in the town to come and see who she found. Andrew goes and finds his brother Simon, come and see who I found. Philip goes and finds Nathaniel, come and see who I found. I found the Messiah. You know, nobody says, well, I found Jesus and that's really nice. I'm, but I don't want to tell anybody. I mean, I shouldn't say nobody does that because a lot of people do it. But you be, when you meet Jesus, you automatically become a missionary because you want to tell everybody about him. I always say to people, I want people to know what I know. I don't want people to sit there looking bored when they're hearing some awesome scripture I want them to be excited about, to know what I know. Not that I know anything special. Well, I mean, I know something special. But we all know that special thing. And I want everybody to know that. I always go back to the um, the Sunday after 9-11. I was in Ann Arbor for a, at a prayer meeting. And everybody was, you know... A few days after 9-11, everybody was kind of, I don't even know what word to use. You know, it was almost as bad as um, when we went to New Orleans a couple of months after Katrina and we did a prayer meeting and saw these people that just were looking at you, but they weren't really looking at you. And you would talk to them and they didn't look like they were listening. They were just kind of staring through you and you know, these horrible things that happened. So there I was on this Sunday night, and this guy who's a good friend of ours, he gets up on the platform and says, we need to pray for Osama bin Laden and his companions because Jesus died for them. And I said, no way. I said, I want him to die today. I want him to go to hell right now, and I want him to suffer there. I said, I'm not going to pray for them. But then, you know, when you think about it later... He's right. Jesus died for him too. Now, I never tried presenting the gospel to Osama bin Laden, but <laughs> that probably would have been a life-threatening experience. <laughs> but anyway, but the mission is to bring people to the cross because this is all Paul talked about. And, you know, people always say to me, you get, don't you get, you get kind of carried away with this Jesus stuff. I say, well, what else is there? What else is this important? 
I mean, if I die from coronavirus next week, I mean, I don't want to. But if I do, Jesus made a way for me. You know, Paul says we don't look at death the way the non-believers do. They look at death as a hopeless thing. Right? A hopeless thing. So, this is all he talked about. And this was a pretty radical message at the time. And it's even more radical message now. Or I should say it's just as a, or just as radical a message now. Because we're out of the mainstream now. I mean, if you're pro-life, you're out of the mainstream. Right? If you don't believe in same-sex marriage, you're out of the mainstream. You know, if I say, well, you know, I'm a man, but really I think I'm a woman. And, you know, I think I should start going through the change. And in the meantime, if I want to go to the ladies' room, you know, who are you to say that? I mean, this is how people think now. And they say, we're out of the mainstream. I mean, you if it wasn't so pathetic, you'd have to laugh. You know, interesting, since Adam and Eve... Men and women have been getting married, right? And having children and their children get married and their children. That's how we all ended up here, right? Everybody knew they were a boy or a girl. <laughs> you didn't have a bunch of boys, you know, on the playground debating were they a boy or a girl. Everybody knew what they were. But now, oh, well, who are you to say? You know, we can't write. Boy, you know, we can't write male or female on the birth certificate because, you know, that's up to the baby what he, she, or it wants to be at age 20. I mean, this is ridiculous what's going on now. And murder a baby, you know, a day before it's due to be born or maybe even while it's being born or Oh, what the heck? How about right after it's born? Maybe this is not what we were expecting. So, we are preaching a radical message too. We don't think it's radical because we grew up knowing the message. But now it's radical. Paul says he didn't come with excellent words or use debating skills. You know, you don't bring people to the cross with a lot of excellent words. Like, I always think, like, you can get 300 theologians together, and they may not be able to save anybody. They know a lot of stuff, right? They may not even be saved themselves. They know a lot of stuff. But unless you know this, unless you bring people to this, you can't bring people to, you know, Augustine's books and say, you better study this book, or else you can't be saved, and, oh, you know, you need to take a course and it's a very simple message. It's not about excellent words. It's not about your intelligence. If it was, it wouldn't be fair, right? That was the Gnosticism, one of the earliest heresies, you know. Well, you know, we smart people, we have some inside information. You common people, you can't be saved, you can't learn anything. <clears throat> so, Paul says he was fearful. He said, I came with fear and trembling. The Greek means weakness and terror. Doesn't mean he was a little nervous when he was going to talk. It says it was weakness and terror. Paul, I mean, he's my hero. He was weak and he had terror. But in that weakness, the message goes out because the Spirit works through us. Right? Power is perfected in our weakness. So when you go and, you know, you, you talk to somebody, if the approach is, well, listen here, you need to know this and you need to know this and you need to read this and if, why don't you do that? And if it, you say, you know what? You're a hopeless sinner and you stand condemned. And there's only one way you can get out of this. And you tell them what's the way to get out of it. Then they have a decision to make. I used to witness to people, and like especially people who were very observant Jews. And when I was done 
you know, going through the sacrifices in the Torah and how this was Jesus and he was the lamb and, and they would roll their eyes and they would say all kinds of stuff. And then when I was done, I would say, well, you're in a different position now than you were a half hour ago because now you either have to accept this or reject it. And, oh, yeah, right. Well, okay, whatever. A lot of eye rolling. But you know, in Second Corinthians, Paul says, Corinthians, Paul says, we bring life and death to people. Because you tell somebody the gospel, and they say, ah, that's a bunch of crap. And they die that night. They're lost. But if they say, oh, wow, nobody ever told me that. And they die that night, and they're saved. You brought them life, you brought the other one death. We have a lot of responsibility on us. And so, the Spirit works through our weaknesses. Now, 2 Corinthians 10.10, I love this. For his letters, they say, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech is contemptible. This is describing Paul. His letters are great, but man, when the dude gets up there, turns the microphone on and starts preaching, he's a wreck. He's got a weak presence and his speech is weird. But Paul says that doesn't matter because signs and wonders accompany the preaching. Even though I might be annoying, there are signs and wonders that come. And when they say that, you know, the Greek that's used there means he he was weak and despised. You know, so people looked at him and said, "What?" you know, like in Athens, they said, what is this babbler trying to say on the Areopagus, Acts 17? Read that for your homework. Athens is the only place he, he made no progress to bring people to the gospel in Athens. Every other Greek city, yes, planted churches everywhere. But in Athens, they didn't want to hear him. So he got there talking to these philosophers on the Areopagus. And I've been up there twice because Paul, my hero, was up there. So, of course, I had to go up there twice. But, you know, he's, he's talking to these philosophers. Oh, I want to tell you about God. He said, you know, he made everything. He made every person. He put them where they need to be. He made them born when they were supposed to be born. And then he sent his son, and his son died for you. And that's how you go to heaven. That's how you can be saved. And the Greeks said, what is this babbler trying to say? Because these were really smart philosophers. Then they said, we want to hear some more about this, but we'll get back to you. And Paul left and never went back to Athens. So, for I am the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. I really don't deserve to be called an apostle, because I was a Pharisee. Jesus appeared to me on the road. But before that, I persecuted the church. I don't deserve to be called an apostle. But by his grace, I am one. Then he goes on to say, I've done more. And I've done more than all the rest of them. Because his arrogance always comes through. But when just the cross and Christ crucified or preached, we know the Spirit's acting on somebody when they believe it. Because it's a foolish message. I don't know who the president of Harvard University is, but it's probably a pretty smart guy. I mean, just guessing. Or the president, you know, president of Caltech or something. I don't know who it is. But one thing for sure, he's a pretty smart guy. Or else he wouldn't be in that position. So when you say to him, you know what? You're a miserable sinner and you stand condemned and Jesus died for you. And if you come to Jesus and repent of your sins and accept him as your savior, you're going to be saved. And he says, oh, yes. Oh, now I understand it. You know the Holy Spirit worked on him. Because his normal reaction would be, aren't you the guy who sweeps the floor and cleans the toilets? Get out of here. So you know the Spirit's acting when somebody believes this foolish message. You know what I mean? Can I get an amen? Because it can only be understood by faith. You can't understand it by reason. You can't understand it by mathematics. You can't do a scientific experiment that proves it. You can't, you can't do a clinical trial, you know. 
these hundred people know Jesus, these hundred people don't. So, you know, let's see what happens when they die. <laughs> you can't do a clinical trial like you can with a new drug. So it's only by faith that this is understood. It's not a system of philosophy. You can't understand it by reasoning. And it's, it's not revealed to you by flesh and blood. Peter at Caesarea Philippi. Right? Caesarea Philippi is this, it's a beautiful place. It's wooded and it's mountainous and there's this beautiful rock with a waterfall coming down. And it was a pagan shrine to the Greek god Pan. Not Peter Pan, but the god Pan. Nobody probably knows who Peter Pan is anymore, but anyway, you guys know who Peter Pan is. Anyway, it was a shrine to the god Pan. So, and it, at that time it was not in Israel proper. It was outside the border of Israel. It was Gentile land. I mean, obviously they had a big shrine to Pan. And in this mountain there was a temple on the top of it. And so people went there to worship Pan. So Jesus took his disciples there. It doesn't tell us in the gospel, but he would have been under this temple that was made to Pan. And he said, well, who do men say that I am? You know, am I like Pan? Am I like just some smart guy who's a rabbi? Am I just somebody who's, you know, a good speaker and a good teacher? And they're like, well, who do people say I am? So, you know, they go through all these things. John the Baptist, Jeremiah, the prophet, with a capital P. And Peter pipes up, and one of the few times Peter said something that was right and was powerful. You know, you're the Christ, you're the Son of the living God. And Jesus doesn't say to him, wow, Peter, you figured it out. This is awesome. I didn't think you were smart enough to figure this out. No, he says, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you. My father revealed this to you. Because it's not, you can't reveal the truth of salvation to somebody unless the Holy Spirit acts on them, because it's all by faith. And it's, that's the radical plan. And like he points out, Paul points out that they all preach the same message. We can't put every scripture up, but in that same passage about, I don't deserve to be called an apostle. You know, he says, well, they're all preaching the same message. And it doesn't matter who you hear the message from, because it's not about them. Right? So if you walked around in the ancient world and said, I heard Peter preach, and that's how I came to believe. And the next guy says, oh, that's nice. I heard Paul preach, and that's how I came to believe. And the other guy's just kind of sitting there going, and they go, well, how about you? You go, well, you know, I heard uh, Joe Blow preach, and that's how I came. <laughs> Who's that? I got. I saw Paul. I saw Peter. Now, it doesn't matter which one of them you saw, because the message comes to you. So Paul says it doesn't matter who told them the message. The important thing is that they got the message, and that they came to faith by the Holy Spirit acting on them. And... Because all of these guys, of course, were Jews, you have to picture, we, see, we can't have the full understanding of it, but you have to think every Saturday morning they were at the synagogue. And every Saturday morning they heard these teachings. They heard these scriptures. And sometimes they understood it. Most of the time they didn't understand it. Paul spent, you know, maybe 18 years studying them. And he thought he understood everything. But now, everything that they heard growing up, everything that they read growing up, if Peter and those guys could read, we don't even know. Paul certainly could read because he knew five languages. But now they understood what that was all about. So now they understood what Isaiah was talking about. They understood what the Torah was talking about with blood sacrifice. They understood Micah. They understood the prophets because now they knew the truth. So he says, I can be bold in my proclamation, not because I'm awesome, but because what I'm proclaiming is so important. What I'm proclaiming is so powerful. He says, I, I'm bold because this is what I do. I proclaim the message. And the message is not from me. 
it's not about the messenger being important. Right? Just like those three guys. Oh, yeah, you know, I heard Joe Blow preach, and I came to faith in Jesus. Everybody laughs. Who? Yeah. <laughs> but, come on, lighten up a little bit. <clears throat> but the messenger is not what's important. The, who the messenger is doesn't really matter. It's the message that has the power. It's like the lion coming out of the cage. It's like the word goes out and has its own power, has its own energy. Because, you know, there's a handful of scriptures you should memorize in your life, at least. If you can memorize all of them or more of them, that's great. But one of the ones you should memorize is 2 Timothy 3.16, which, you know, all scripture is inspired by God. The Greek word is theopneustos, which means breathed out by God. This is his word. This is his very breath that comes out of him. This is not a book like you read War and Peace, or you read Gone with the Wind, or you read Tom Sawyer. This is a living word, because God breathes it out. Then he goes on to say, you know, you're supposed to use it to Learn and reprove and see. I didn't memorize it very well, but it's the 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 important part of it is that it's breathed out, and it's not about the fact that Paul wrote down the words. What's important is that the Holy Spirit inspired it, actually expired it, a little more technically, but 